very good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Crescent Church. Um, my name is Oli Neal. I'm the co-host of the Equip Project podcast, and it's a joy to welcome you to this uh, Equip Live Easter special. Um, really appreciate you coming out uh, on a beautiful uh, Easter Sunday evening, um, and I hope you enjoy your time with us. Just to give you a little bit of a sense of what's going to go on tonight, um, I'm going to give a, a brief introduction to the topic, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. After that, Jim and I are going to sit down together and have a 15, 20-minute discussion, uh, and we're going to discuss the evidence for the resurrection, some of the philosophical questions concerned with the resurrection, and then finally, what the resurrection means for our lives personally. Um, after that, we're going to take some questions from you guys. Uh, so please do start submitting those questions via Slido. If you go to slido.com and type in the code 3366778, which will be rotating on the screens, and type in your question. Do feel free to ask anything. Uh, we'll try and prioritize questions related to the death, resurrection, and ascension. Um, and can we also ask that your questions are considerate of those who maybe aren't yet Christians? Uh, we'd love uh, for those here tonight who maybe don't yet know Jesus to feel uh, comfortable and welcome, and we'd love the questions to help them too. After that, Jim's going to close out with a kind of a short epilogue uh, to round off our time. Um, so hopefully it's a, it's a good evening, hopefully you enjoy it, uh, and it's a blessing to you. Uh, but let's start our time together by singing. Let's praise the risen Lord Jesus as we stand to sing together, uh, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Um, it's a beautiful song which really reflects on the work of the Lord Jesus um, and finishes with a, a glorious rallying cry concerning his resurrection. Uh, so we'll stand to sing this song after the intro together.
Let's just turn to God in prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we praise you for the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the one who truly is the greatest treasure of our longing souls, the one who bore our guilt and shame on the cross and suffered in our place that we might come into the fullness of life. Lord, and today we've been delighting in his resurrection, triumph over death and sin, conquering evil once and for all. And Lord, we now live in the good of that glorious resurrection life. Lord, we're confident that one day all evil will be destroyed and put down forever. And Lord, we are filled with hope as a result. So Lord, we ask that tonight might be a a blessing to all who are here. We pray that um, we each might leave here with more confidence in the reality of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. We pray that each person here might leave with hope uh, in their hearts as a result of what we discussed tonight. So would you bless us? Would you be present amongst us? Uh, Would you be working by your Holy Spirit in each of our hearts for your glory in Christ's name? Amen. Just a couple of of church announcements. Uh, Next Sunday is our Crescent International Aid Sunday, and in our morning service, we're going to be visited by Chris Thompson, who is the Northern Ireland Director of Tear Fund. He's going to be coming to speak to us in the morning. And then in the evening, we're going to be looking at Matthew's Gospel. We've been doing a series in Matthew's Gospel. In fact, we were doing it a little while ago, and we're kind of resuming that series next Sunday evening. Um, And we're going to be joined by Stephen Shaw from Scrabo Hall, um, who's going to be teaching us from Matthew chapter 11. And that evening service is at 7 p.m., and it'd be great if you could come along. Okay, let's begin considering our topic tonight, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I wonder what you think when you hear the claim that Jesus rose from the dead. This is what prominent atheist Richard Dawkins thinks. He said the resurrection is so petty, it's so trivial, it's so local, it's so earthbound, it's so unworthy of the universe. And he went on, the accounts of Jesus' resurrection and ascension are about as well documented as Jack and the Beanstalk a very typical Richard Dawkins type of response. But if he's right, if the resurrection is in fact a load of rubbish, then Christianity is dead, it's worthless. The claims of Jesus Christ, they rise and fall on the validity of the resurrection. And I wonder if you knew that those who wrote the Bible also realized how much was at stake when it came to the question of the resurrection. The Apostle Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, he wrote these words to a group of Christians. He said, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And he went on, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. In other words, Paul is saying, if Jesus isn't alive, Christians are completely wasting their time. The Christians here at Crescent, they might as well pack up and go home because their faith is pointless. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he was not God in human form. He wasn't who he said he was. At best, he was a madman so delusional, he thought he was someone he was not. At worst, he was a deceiver who claimed to be someone he knew he was not. But if Jesus really did rise from the dead, well, then the world really has been turned on its head. If the resurrection actually happened, Jesus' claims about himself are completely validated. He really is who he said he was. He really is God in human form. He really does have the power to forgive your sin tonight. He really has punched a hole through death. And he really is the one and only savior of the world. He can transform your life. He can give you an eternal hope Hope in the middle of a messed up, sin-scarred world. If the resurrection happened, Jesus is the King of Kings. And that means the way we respond to him, it really does matter, doesn't it? In fact, the Bible would say that our response to him determines what happens to us after we die, where we spend eternity, whether it's with Christ in his heavenly kingdom or apart from Christ in a place of judgment, which the Bible calls hell. That shows how serious it is. 
So the answer to the question, did Jesus rise from the dead? Well, it's an enormously important one, isn't it? Regardless of whether you're a Christian here tonight, a Jew, a Muslim, a Hindu, an atheist, or anything else. The earliest record we have of Jesus' death and resurrection is found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses three to five. And scholars believe that these verses uh, actually are a quote by the Apostle Paul of an earlier creed. A creed is like a statement of faith or belief. And that creed, they believe, was first developed by the early church in around AD 36. And given that Jesus was crucified in approximately AD 30, this creed shows us that within five years, of his death, Christians firmly believed that Jesus had been raised to life again and that he appeared to his followers alive. This evidence actually counters claims the resurrection was a myth that developed hundreds of years after the events unfolded. Within just a few short years, people were already talking in these terms. Let's just read what the creed says. This is what Paul writes. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the 12. You might be surprised to learn that even secular and atheist historians agree on a pool of evidence concerning the resurrection. New Testament scholar Dr. Gary Habermas reviewed and compiled a bibliography of over 3,000 scholarly articles and books on the topic. And then he went through all these articles and picked out only the core evidence. That is the evidence accepted by the majority of scholars, regardless of their belief or lack of belief in God. And it's this core evidence that Jim and I are gonna spend some time considering this evening as we seek to argue a case for the resurrection. As I interview Jim now, I'm gonna ask him about four areas of core evidence. The first is the death of Jesus. The second is the empty tomb. The third is the post-mortem appearances of Jesus. And the fourth is the emergence of the church. So Jim, let's get going. Come on up, Jim, come and join me. This is not the music I wanted to be playing, I have to be honest. Um, We'll have to explain to those who maybe aren't listeners to the podcast what that was that we just heard there, Jim. I mean, it's a bizarre sort of screeching kind of music that I was not in favor of, but you were very much in favor of. What actually was that we just heard? Yeah, you were sort of more into 1980s synthesizer, X-File music, you know? It was excellent. It was terrible. Um, so mainly, I, I chose that, that piece of music, which is played on a hurdy-gurdy, um, a medieval instrument, uh, primarily to annoy Ollie. <laughs> um, so it's a magnificent piece of music. No, to be honest, I, it, it has grown on me, I must say. But Jim, um, we're not very used to this, sitting in front of an audience. Um, we really appreciate you guys coming, but you do make us a little bit nervous, I have to confess. Absolutely, it's a tough crowd. This does feel strange. Uh, we do feel a bit intimidated, but I'm encouraged, Jim, because the last time uh, we did a live podcast, I actually was panicking about you not showing up. The, the time yeah. w- was getting closer and closer. I was sitting there, it was at Stramellis College, in That's fact, right. and I was thinking, man, like, Jim is still not here. It's about, we've got about 10 minutes to go. Well, there was a reason for that. It was the night of the great storm. If you remember, it was a terrible storm, and I, I, I live in darkest Kalinchi, so I was n- swerving around fallen trees and various bits of debris on the road. Uh, I remember that night very clearly because at one point in our conversation, we were, uh, I was quoting Psalm 46. Um, uh, you know, though, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. And just as I quoted that, yeah. there was this enormous gust of wind that almost took the roof off the building. It was tremendously dramatic. I hope it that was, doesn't happen tonight. It was a dramatic evening. And you arrived with about two minutes to spare I and did. claimed you, you know, had to get over some fallen tree or whatever. But we, we got it done. But it's been we a did. lot more relaxed tonight in the build-up. But Jim, I've, I've been through uh, kind of a, the, the four kind of core areas of evidence there in my intro. And I just want to spend a bit of time unpacking those with you. Let's just recap them. The death of Christ, the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances of Jesus, and the emergence of the church. And let's go through each in turn, beginning with the death of Jesus. What is the evidence that Jesus actually died by crucifixion? And why is that important? Why does that matter? Okay, let me make a preliminary point um, before we get into that. Um, Both of us believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. 
but for our purposes tonight, uh, we're going to treat the 27 New Testament, docu New Testament documents as we would treat any other ancient historical document, okay? Because I'm very conscious, um, uh, if you're not a Christian here tonight, then let me say, first of all, you're tremendously welcome. We really are glad that you're here. Uh, but if I was just to start off saying the Bible is the inspired word of God and use that in a circular argument, you know, the Bible is true because the Bible says it's true, we would get nowhere. So for our purposes tonight, we're just going to treat the New Testament documents as documents. And uh, lots of, as you say, lots of scholars, whether they be atheistic or liberal or, um, or conservative, uh, treat the, the documents in that way. So why can we have confidence that um, Jesus actually died? I think there are five reasons. The first is, in, in the language of, of the historian Tom Holland, the Romans knew how to kill people. They had detailed procedures. Uh, terrible punishments were enacted on a, on a death squad if they failed in their duty. And uh, the New Testament itself uh, records that they checked to see that Jesus was dead. So that's the first. Um, the second is the, the catastrophic injuries which Jesus received uh, must have led to his death. His scourging on its own almost killed him. Uh, then there was the obvious crucifixion, but then there's that moment when uh, the Roman soldier uh, uses his spear and plunges his spear up under the ribcage to the heart of Jesus. Um, so that's another reason. Uh, uh, then moving on, I think one of the interesting things is when you read the records, there was a lot of, an extended period of contact with Jesus after his death. So, you know, the nails had to be removed from, from the cross. Uh, the Lord's body had to be washed and then wrapped. And the, it's impossible to conceive that the people who were doing that over that quite extended period were not uh, looking at the obvious signs of death, mm. which are, there are three obvious signs of death. The temperature of the body drops, um, the body becomes rigid, and then there's is it lividity, there's, there's discoloration which comes as a result of death. It's impossible that they wouldn't have noticed those things. Uh, so the swoon theory uh, is just blown out of the water, really. Um, uh, as, well, just one other thing, um, yeah, that I want to say. The, the, there's an interesting little detail in John's gospel. When the soldier uh, plunges a spear up under the Lord's ribcage, it says blood and water came out. And I'm having to look at my notes here because that is one of the signs of death from injury. It's a pericardial or plural effusion, uh, modern medics would say. I guess the last thing I'm going to say as a piece of evidence is that it's not just the New Testament documents which record that Jesus died. Um, some of the, the biggest names in ancient his, history, like uh, Josephus, Tacitus, Lucian, they all uh, record that Jesus died. Brilliant. So there's, there's even extra biblical evidence that, that Jesus really did die. And, and this matters because of well, what Jim alluded to there, the swoon theory, the idea that some people say, oh, Jesus maybe uh, revived in, in the cold of, of the tomb. Uh, and actually, the, the evidence isn't there to suggest that was possible. Uh, it, it's very clear that he did die. Could, could I just quote, actually, I forgot yep. to do this, John Dominic Crossman, uh, who is <clears throat> a, a very strong atheist. He's the head of the Jesus Seminary. Um, and he says that Jesus was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be. So this isn't, we're not talking about evangelical scholars here. No. Brilliant. So that's our, our first piece of core evidence. Let's move on to the second, the empty tomb. Um, what evidence is there concerning the tomb actually being empty? Okay, we need to divide your question into two. First of all, we have to establish that Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and then that that tomb was empty. So let's, let's take the burial. You already said, actually, that um, my, my first point, that the burial story is very, very early. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul explicitly mentions the burial of Jesus. And he he is quoting a, an early creed, which, as you say, goes back to about AD 36, AD 37. And the same um, sort of linguistic analysis can be performed on Mark's account of the burial, which also leads scholars to think that it is as, at the, around about the same time. Okay, so it's very early. That's the first point. Um, <clears throat> the, the, probably the, the most important point to make is the character of Joseph of Arimathea could not just have been made up Right? He's obviously an actual historical figure. Mm. 
uh, if the disciples had just invented an, an imaginary member of the Sanhedrin, their case would have been, you know, would have lost all credibility. So Joseph of Arimathea was a real historical figure. Um, the, the story of the burial is in keeping with the Jewish customs of the time. Uh, in fact, the Jews at that time were, were fascinated with the tombs of what we might call famous people. So the whole account of the women going to visit the tomb is entirely uh, plausible given Jewish customs of the day. Um, and I suppose the last point in terms of the burial is there is no other tradition, there is no other story in, from the ancient uh, documents. And remember, we have 27,000 of them. Um, uh, no other tradition exists. So that's, that establishes that Jesus was buried in, in the tomb of, of uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Now, the empty tomb. You mentioned Gary Habermas. And he did this survey of all shapes and sizes of scholars. And uh, this was a long time ago, and he got 75% of scholars ag agreed that the tomb was empty. He has just published an, a, an enormous book, um, which I will probably buy and hopefully read mm -hmm. at some point. Um, and he did another survey, and it has gone up to 85%. Mm -hmm. Now, to get 85% of academics to agree on anything is, mm -hmm. is astonishing. Uh, so 85% of scholars admit, uh, agree that the tomb was empty. So that's just a general point. Um, they put enormous weight on the testimony of the women because given the cultural prejudices of that day, if you were making the story up, to place your testimony on mm -hmm. women would have been ridiculous. So scholars take that very, very seriously. Um, but the crucial argument here is the response of the Jews. Um, why did they not produce the body of Jesus? That's the obvious thing to do. Um, so uh, that, that, that'll do me for that. Brilliant, thanks, Jim. Let, let's move on to our third area of core evidence then, um, what I described as the post-mortem appearances of Jesus, uh, the idea that actually many people believed they'd seen Jesus alive post-crucifixion. Um, there seems to be scholarly agreement that actually many groups of people or, or individuals did believe that they had seen Jesus post-crucifixion. How do we explain that and what, what evidence is there for that? Again, it's really interesting that uh, modern scholarship agrees that quite a large number of people believed that they saw the risen Christ. Mm. Okay? Uh, so that is agreed, that, that's largely agreed. Um, now, let's get into the evidence of that. Um, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15 and the, the, the fact that that is a creed which is probably going to be traced back to about AD 36, 37. It's interesting, round about that time, not long after the Apostle Paul is converted, he goes to Jerusalem, we read this in Galatians, and he interviews two eyewitnesses, Peter and James. And the Greek word that's used for the conversation they had is the word for cross-examination. So he cross-examines Peter and James as eyewitnesses. Um, so there is a direct eyewitness evidence of, of the, the risen Christ from Scripture itself. Um, so let's now think about, so then the next point would be, it wasn't just people who followed Jesus who became convinced uh, and had encounters with the risen Christ. It was skeptics, like Saul of Tarsus, obviously, but others as well, uh, even his brother James um, is an example. So the only, this is where you have to say, either he rose from the dead or else you've got two options, um, hallucination or fraud. And interestingly, modern atheist scholars who don't have any time for the supernatural don't go down those routes because the hallucination theory um, makes no sense because a mass hallucination is psychologically impossible. Okay? Um, so, uh, and the fact that the Lord appeared to people in groups uh, is seen as, as quite strong evidence. And as far as the, the, you know, the fraud theory, the fact that the disciples stole the body uh, and that model, uh, again, the more we have learned about the Roman army, remember the Roman army was brutal. And so if those soldiers had actually allowed the body to be stolen, uh, they would have been executed. So the fact, I, I think it's really plausible that the hatred that the Sanhedrin had um, for, 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 for Jesus uh, was such that they, they bribed the soldiers to, to allow them to, be, uh, to, to say that he was stolen. But given the procedures of the Roman army, the, the chances of uh, a body high behind an imperial mm. seal being stolen are, are zero. 
Brilliant. So we have to believe something about why people convinc were convinced that they saw the risen Jesus. And, and actually, what, what you seem to be saying is the alternative explanations don't carry a lot of weight. Right. They, they seem hard to substantiate. Let's move on then to the final area of, of core evidence um, for the resurrection, and that's the emergence of the church. How does the emergence of the church provide evidence for the resurrection? This is the killer argument. You have this group of terrified, um, uh, defeated, dejected men, and they suddenly are transformed into the most courageous evangelists, men who laid down their li men and women who laid down their lives for this. And everyone in this room knows that we are here and Western civilization is here because of those guys. Those guys turned the world upside down. And um, everything, because Christianity is the driving force for the rise of Western civilization. So something happened. And the idea that they were so courageous to live out a lie is just psychologically implausible. It's just impossible to believe that people allowed themselves to be, you know, um, uh, martyred for, for a lie. Brilliant. Um, moving on to some slightly different questions then, Jim, away from sort of the core evidence. There may be a, a, some people here who think the resurrection is, is perhaps a little bit like a legendary myth, maybe like one of the Greek myths, perhaps. Uh, and maybe they think the idea of um, the resurrection of Jesus only came into existence sort of much later, perhaps, or um, it, it developed over time kind of iteratively. How would you respond to, to someone who, who felt that or believed that? Well, maybe a century ago, that was a plausible, uh, you know, at the height of, you know, well, maybe even earlier when, when German higher criticism was around, that was a, that was a plausible idea. The idea that the Christ of faith is an invention of the church in the third and fourth and fifth centuries, completely divorced from the authentic Jesus who was just a slightly bumbling, you know, rabbi. Um, uh, but recent scholarship has completely reversed that. And as I say, the, the amazing thing is it's actually come from critical scholarship because they've analyzed all these uh, syntactical patterns and linguistic features uh, and discovered these early creeds embedded within the New Testament documents which trace things back. So, it's widely agreed now uh, that this, uh, it's called DDR, right? Widely agreed that the deity, the death, and the resurrection of Christ were uh, at the heart of the Christian community within years of the Lord's crucifixion, possibly even months. Right? That's, that's really powerful, and I think very much counters uh, anyone who would argue that. Um, Someone else perhaps might be thinking, well, we've got four accounts of, of the crucifixion and, and the resurrection in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, and maybe someone has read those, and, and that's a really good thing to do, and we'd encourage you to do that. But, but perhaps they see things that seem like slight differences, uh, and maybe they feel that those are perhaps even discrepancies or contradictions. It, is, is it possible to harmonize those four accounts? Well, the, the, I, I think it is possible. Um, for the, one of the things you need to understand is the garden of the tomb was very close to the city. It was only about a 10 minute walk. Um, so you get, you get this picture of lots of people rushing back and forward when you piece all the, the jigsaw pieces together. And there's also a great deal of angelic activity. So the mighty angel who comes down, just as there was at the Lord's birth, of course. So the mighty angel who comes down is this utterly, you know, and rolls the stone away, is this utterly terrifying creature. Whereas the two, young, the two other angels who look like young men are much more approachable and less scary. Uh, so um, there was a lot of angelic activity going around. So you might come up with a, a scheme which sees uh, Mary Magdalene, who spent Saturday night in Bethany, and she and her uh, friend, um, uh, Clopas's wife, isn't that right? Um, they come to the house in, in Jerusalem and they pick up, uh, isn't it, Salome? And, they would probably use, I think it was called the Geneth Gate to get to the garden. Um, and there's a little uh, interesting hint about Joanna, that she was very wealthy. So she probably lived in that part of Jerusalem near the Hasmonean Palace somewhere. So she, have, she and her friend would have used the, the Ephraim Gate. So two groups of women could probably arise at the same time. So you can piece it together. There is a book, if those of you are interested, um, called The Easter Enigma by John Wenham. And I think that's a very plausible harmonization. Brilliant. And actually, 
you know, we would argue that it, in, a, in a way it's reassuring that the accounts aren't just Completely. O overtly plagiarized. Absolutely right. <laughs> You know, that, that gives confidence that there were yeah. multiple eyewitnesses to these events. Yeah. And also this sense of almost confusion that you get and, and mm -hmm. people rushing around, you know, and, and running to the tomb and running yeah. back. So, yeah. Yeah, it has the hallmarks of, of authenticity. authenticity. That's right. Absolutely. In my introduction, I read from 1 Corinthians 15. We've referenced it a few times now, Jim. And, and in that section, um, Paul refers to Christ being raised according to the scriptures. Um, was the resurrection really foretold in the Old Testament? And, and what scriptures might Paul have been talking about? It's interesting, you know, how many times God does things on the third day in, in the Old Testament. So uh, think of creation. Um, the first two days are spent, you know, creating structure and frameworks. But then life bursts forth on the third day. Um, when, in Genesis 22, uh, when Isaac is, is uh, sacrificed and then, uh, or not sacrificed, uh, Hebrews puts it, he, Abraham received him from the dead. So it's a picture of resurrection. That was on the third day, hmm. okay, uh, on a hill outside cool. what later became Jerusalem. Uh, Hosea talks about God saving his people on the third day. But the, the main one, because uh, it's the one that the Lord himself refers to, is Jonah. So Jonah uh, was in the belly of the whale for the fish for three days and three nights. Um, and that's a picture of death and then resurrection. So. Brilliant. Thanks, Jim. Let's move on then to some more, what we might call philosophical questions. So um, the, the first one is, we've, we've spent quite a bit of time going over the facts here. Um, perhaps someone's thinking, well, okay, that, that sounds great, you know, that, that potentially is persuasive, but does it really matter that the resurrection is objectively true? Isn't it also powerful as kind of a, a mythic story, um, a great story of how light can triumph over darkness? Why can't we just derive the good from it that way? Why does it need to be true? <laughs> um, <clears throat> there's a guy called Rudolf Bultmann who made that argument in, in the 1970s. But the less said about him, the better. Um, <laughs> it's interesting to contrast Christianity with the religions of the East at this point, and I'm thinking particularly of, say, Hinduism or Taoism or something. You, you never really get a lot of controversy over the story of, you know, um, Krishna being a, a, an incarnation, an avatar of Vishnu. Um, you, you don't get atheist websites trolling, trolling through uh, the Bhagavad Gita for particular verses to look for incon inconsistencies. Uh, and that's because, and I say this with all respect to Hinduism, um, in a sense, this, the, the narrative of Hinduism is there to provide a, uh, a rich rhetoric for a religion that ultimately is about self-help. It's about a religion that helps you formulate your values, helps you formulate your approach to life. So in that sense, it doesn't actually matter because the heart of the religion, and with Buddhism too, is essentially self-help. Right? But Christianity is different because Christianity has this astonishing claim that God came to save us, that he actually entered into history, he entered into space-time. And as a result of his intervention, we can have forgiveness and healing and hope now, so that's why it matters that it's true. And that's why Paul says, if Christ be not raised from the dead, our faith is futile, because we're not forgiven, we're still in our sins. Um, so it matters primarily because Christianity offers uh, a salvation, uh, and that is anchored in, in, in the truth of history. How can we believe in, a, in an event that's so far outside our experience? Um, doesn't resurrection just seem like a great anomaly? You know, people were born, they lived, they died, the resurrection happened, but afterwards people have been born, they've lived, and they've died. How, how do you explain such an anomaly? How, how does that fit? I have enormous sympathy for this view. In fact, if you're not a Christian here tonight, I strongly suspect that a lot of the arguments we've put forward have just washed over you because you're thinking it's just so unlikely. You know, it's so outside my experience. And it's this, as you say, this giant blip, this this giant uh, anomaly in history. So very often when young adults ask me that, I would say, um, do you believe in the Big Bang? And most of them say yes. So 13.8 billion years ago, uh, there was a singularity and uh, you know, space, time, and matter create, were created. And I said, have you ever experienced the Big Bang? Have you ever lived through one? Well, of course not. It was a singularity. So why do you believe it? Why do you believe something that's outside your own experience? Now, the reason that's quite a powerful metaphor, uh, he said in a self-congratulatory <laughs> tone, um, is that the resurrection is a singularity. The, the way you see 
the credibility of the resurrection is to pan the camera back and see the overall big picture of Christianity. That um, Christians would argue that the resurrection is the fulcrum, it's the hinge of eternity. That before the resurrection, uh, if you like, we were walking slowly into the night of oblivion and darkness. Uh, and after the resurrection, uh, we were walking into the light of the dawn. That uh, Christ, by triumphing over sin and death, has um, the, the resurrection was the first fruits uh, of a, a, a victory that will lead all of us into a world which is free from evil and sin and death. So um, the credibility of the resurrection, if you just preach the resurrection as an event, an event, it's so anomalous that I think it's very, it doesn't have a lot of credibility. You have to look at it in, in, in the theological framework. It's now been over 2,000 years since the resurrection. And you know, we're sitting here in Belfast in, in 2024, and, and perhaps someone's thinking, well, how can you know, the death and resurrection of a man such a long time ago have any real relevance for my life in, in Belfast in Northern Ireland this evening? What would you say to that? Well, if Jesus is a mere man, it is absolutely none. The death of a man 2,000 years ago, um, it would just be uh, an unfortunate, barbaric death. Again, you need to understand if you're going to consider Christianity rationally, you need to understand this overall theological message that Christ is no mere man. He is God the Son, the second person of the Trinity who came into this world, took on human nature. And on the cross, you see God the Son bear the punishment for all the moral debt that we have incurred and pay that. And in so doing, he takes on our two biggest enemies, sin and death. And... Um, that only makes sense if Jesus is divine. Because you, John Stott, the Christian theologian, describes the cross as the self-substitution of God. That God takes it on himself. And that is the essence of love. Right? God so loved the world that he put himself uh, in, in, in your place in order to save you. It's the essence of love. And so when, when you see the big picture of, of Jesus as God the Son uh, and uh, the, 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 the resurrection as the vindication of his victory over sin and death, it is that theological framework which makes the whole thing credible. Brilliant. And, and the claim is that, that anyone here tonight can come into the good of that. Even, even though those events happened sure. over 2,000 years ago, it's possible for anyone tonight to enjoy that, that salvation, that forgiveness, that welcome into the presence Absolutely. of God. I mean, it's, I'm, going, I'm going to be philosophical here for a moment. The, the biggest problem in, in philosophy is the relationship between the one and the many, between the universal and the particular. And in the incarnation, the universal becomes particular. And then when Christ ascends, rises and ascends, the particular becomes universal again. So anyone from any culture in any time period can avail themselves uh, of the salvation that was affected at a particular point in time. Yeah, that's powerful. The final question I want to ask you, Jim, before we turn to, to questions from, um, from these guys uh, is this. Uh, sadly, many people in our world today live with a great deal of, a great deal of fear and anxiety. Um, I, I think particularly in the younger generations, there's a real crisis of, of anxiety and, and mental health struggles. Um, and I'm sure there's many in this room, perhaps, who will know the pain of that in a very real way. How is the resurrection the, ulti the ultimate antidote to fear? I'm not going to quote Psalm 46 in case something happens to the roof. Um, <laughs> fear, let's think about fear uh, and anxiety. It, it comes from uncertainty. Um, you know, a, a big challenge up ahead or loss of security or, um, you know, thinking that we're heading into some, into trouble. In other words, fear is triggered by our view of the future, okay? So the resurrection verdict, uh, the resurrection teaches us that the verdict is in, the, the, our, our future has been rendered certain. I mean, to give a really silly example, suppose you're on a football team and you're, you're, you're playing against a particularly vicious opposition, but you've already got enough points in the bag, you know, you've already qualified. So. Yes, you may even lose this particular battle. You may get a few bruises, but in a sense, it doesn't matter because you've already, the, the victory has already been achieved. You, um, you've already qualified. So the resurrection 
uh, teaches us that good will triumph over evil because good has, evil has already been put down. Uh, and the fact that your future has been rendered certain is the ultimate existential security that you need. Brilliant. Let's just take a couple of minutes now to submit any questions on Slido, and then Jim and I will come back, and we'll have a look at them together. So let's just take a, a two-minute break. Can we play the music again? We can, we can. I believe we can play the music again. Uh, very, keep, it, keep it down, keep it nice and low uh, in the background. But yeah, thank you, Jim. Thank you all so much for your questions. It was a really, a really good selection there. Um, and to be honest, Jim, I've looked through them, and there's one that stands out. And it's just two words, very simple. Favorite cake. Uh, my sister's Battenberg cake. Your sister's Battenberg cake. Yeah. That's a good answer. I mean, Helen yeah. is an excellent cook. Um, my favorite cake's probably carrot cake, to be honest. What do you think of, what do you think of carrot cake? I think it's an abomination. I just <laughs> the notion of putting building a cake around a vegetable is yeah. Just I had a feeling. I had a feeling you would have a very it's some negative. sort of hipster thing that you're yeah. into, isn't it? Yeah, Jim and I don't like. We don't really see eye to eye on a, on quite a few things. No. Thankfully, uh, Christianity we, we do, but um, but coffee is another big issue oh. we have. We. Uh, really struggle. He takes me to these places and you ask for milk and everybody stands up and stares at you, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I thought over time I'd win it. I thought I, over time I'd win him over and I have catastrophically failed. Um, so please pray for me in that. Mm -hmm. um, but no, let's, let's, let's address some of these uh, more significant questions, Jim. Um, and to begin with, one that is very difficult to answer, to be honest. In, in what form was the risen Christ? Uh, and is he still in that form today? 
while seated at the right hand of God? Will he have his scars in the new creation? Well, in a sense, this is going to be a very, a very short answer because I don't know. Um, uh, there, is, there are some theologians who think that the resurrection body of Jesus is not the same as the, the, the body that he has in, in the heavenlies. Um, the crucial thing is that the body of Jesus after the resurrection is probably a new thing in reality, that, which is it is indestructible. He lives in the power of an indestructible life. Um, but uh, rather than the conditional immortality which Adam and Eve had, for example, they had to keep eating of the tree of life uh, to stay, you know, so they didn't die. Um, so, uh, but when it comes to these things, heaven is such a different mode of reality that uh, it would be uh, unwise to speculate. Okay, uh, next question. Why didn't Jesus save himself when he had the opportunity on the cross? Because he loves you and... Uh, of course he could have saved himself and uh, called 12 legions of angels. Um, but he, in many ways, when you think of the Lord with his hands outstretched, he's holding on to his loyalty to his Father in heaven. And he's also holding on to you and me. And he is loyal to us. And uh, if you think of the first Adam, whenever he sinned, and the first thing he did was disloyalty. He said, it wasn't me, it was that woman you gave me. Yeah? Uh, whereas... The Lord Jesus stood at the head of the human race and took, said, I take responsibility for that. So he didn't save himself because um, the lover always gives himself for the beloved. Yeah, and there's that, there's that deeply kind of ironic and tragic moment where the people around the cross are, are saying, save your, yourself and us. Mm-hmm. And the irony is that actually only by staying could he save them. Uh, and I think it's just such a, a profound moment. But yeah, thank you for that question. Isaiah, just quickly, Isaiah makes that point with tremendous irony because in Isaiah 53, around the the central stanza, you have a description of the lovelessness of humanity and then on the other side, the oppression and injustice of humanity. So around the cross, you have nothing but lovelessness and injustice and on the center, you have the reconciliation of love and justice. It's beautiful. For such a momentous event as the resurrection of Jesus, should we not expect records in literature outside the Bible, asks Richard. Well, we, we, we have uh, historians from the ancient world who record that Christians claimed that Jesus rose from the dead, uh, but obviously they don't believe it. They thought it was you know, a nonsense religion. Uh, but certainly the claims of Christianity were recorded by other, um, uh, other historians. But you got, I mean, there's a general point here. You know, the Lord deliberately chose a life of obscurity. You know, he, 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 he chose a life um, in, in a provincial little town. Um, and that was a deliberate policy, to go incognito. Um, Brilliant. Why did Jesus have to wait three days for resurrection? Why could it not have happened immediately? Well, not having direct access to the councils of God. Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, it's interesting. The, I, I would fo- follow the following um, model, that within the realm of death, there was this place called paradise, which was uh, before the resurrection. Um, people didn't go to heaven, right? Even faithful servants like Abraham went to this place called paradise, which was like a, a region within the realm of death. <coughs> Excuse me. So the Lord could say to the dying thief, "Today you'll be with me in paradise," because Jesus was, he was going into death. <coughs> um, but having gone in, he then broke the prison walls down and led captivity captive and led all of God's faithful people uh, into the very direct presence of God. There's a few on uh, reconciling the different accounts, and, and obviously we've touched on that already. The, the book you suggested, Jim, um, that's helpful is an Easter enigma, is that correct? John Wenham. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's potentially a, a book to look at if the, the reconciliation of those accounts is something that you've, you've been struggling with. Um, there's a question here uh, about if, if, if Jesus provided salvation on the cross for us, what happened to people who died before the cross, before Jesus' time? Well, um, there is no other name 
under heaven by which you can be saved. Everyone who gets into heaven will be saved by the blood of Christ. But that doesn't mean that, <coughs> excuse me, I wonder could somebody get me a glass of water? Yeah. Come <coughs> on, just grab. Please grab some water, Tony. Thanks. There's probably one behind me. Um, excuse me. Um, thank you very much. That's great, Tony. Um, what was I talking about? Uh, so the idea of people prior to the cross. Oh, yes. Um, so obviously, uh, I think we would all agree that Abraham is in heaven. Um, but so he was saved by the blood of the Lamb. Um, but uh, all his sins were paid for by Jesus on the cross. Uh, but he himself never got to hear the name Jesus before he died. But everyone is, is under the blood of the Lamb. That's helpful. Thank you, Jim. Um, there's a question here about the timing of uh, the, the death of Jesus and, and, and the resurrection. So uh, the question asks, how do we reconcile the fact that it was predicted he, he Christ would, would rise in three days, but he died on the Friday afternoon and rose first thing on the Sunday morning, 1.5 days? Uh, do, what are your thoughts on that? It, it's, it's very complicated because of uh, John, I think, uses Roman time rather than Jewish time and things like that, but also, when days start under the Jewish calendar, okay. uh, Ju days start uh, uh, in, in at twilight, if you like, and the e what we would say the evening before. Um, so that's probably why it's difficult. To yeah, uh, and I would say, like, actually, funny enough, I, I just saw someone post about this on social media earlier today, and there are actually charts you can get that, that sort of map out the, the timing, and um, which are quite useful. So perhaps that question or that might be something you want to look into um, just to get a sense of of uh, yeah, how time worked back then, and that helps explain that, that particular query. Um, there's passages in the Bible, e.g. E uh, the woman caught in adultery that don't appear in the earliest manuscripts. How do you view um, these types of passages? Do you consider them to be inspired scripture? Yeah, well, let's, let's start with the positive. There are only two portions of the Bible that are disputed, and that's the first 12 verses of John 8 and the last few verses of Mark's gospel. Uh, everything else is undisputed. I mean, that is just astonishing. That's 99.95, I think, percent. Um, I, I do personally believe, so, so let's take the John 8 one, the, the woman caught in adultery. Even those scholars who say that it shouldn't be in John, uh, because it's not in the earliest manuscripts, you know, and sometimes I think on one occasion it's tagged on to the end of another gospel. Uh, scholars who don't think it should be in John all agree that the event happened and that it uh, was accurately recorded. So, uh, but I think for structural reasons, I think it should be in John's gospel. If you actually look at the pattern of the conversations which the Lord has with women in John's gospel, I think it makes enormous structural sense. Um, so I, I treat it as scripture. And this church, I think as a matter of policy, does. Um, as far as the last verses of Mark go, uh, again, I, I take it as scripture. Um, drinking down poison. Let's just hope it's inspired. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that would be my position. Great. Just two more questions then. Um, this question asks, uh, and they say, Islamic jihadists and others martyr themselves for Allah or, <coughs> you know, I guess, other, other gods or other causes. You see people martyring themselves. What makes the early Christians different? You mentioned the fact that they were willing to die for this, this new belief. How, how do they, do they differ? Of course they do. Uh, jihadism is a, a narcissistic cult of death. Uh, the early Christians were not suicide bombers. Um, they were martyrs uh, in that they stood loyal to God. They didn't hurt anybody. They didn't try and harm anyone. Um, the Roman crowds bayed as you know, leopards tore the 20-year-old girls to pieces. That's completely different from, they, they, they accepted the, the, the right of the state to punish them. That is completely different from some cult of death which tries to uh, use their own bodies as a weapon. The final question I want to ask Jim um, is actually on a slightly different topic, but I, I think it's, it's a useful one to end on. So a lot of our, our podcast episodes deal with um, kind of preparing for life in a world that's 
increasingly quite opposed to, to God and to Christian things. Sometimes we might describe it as a post-Christian world or a post-truth world, i.e. a world where truth is up for grabs. Uh, it's relative, regarded as relative rather than objective. Um, so someone asks, um, I, I guess for some advice about how to deal with this kind of world, and they write, what strategic steps can young adults take to prepare for living in tomorrow's post-Christian and post post-truth world? How would you respond to that? Um, well, my immediate instinctive reaction is to think about the letter which Jeremiah wrote to the exiles uh, when they were exiled to Babylon and he told them to settle down and build homes. Uh, in other words, accept that you're in a pagan culture. Right? There were false prophets who were dancing around at that time saying, don't worry guys, we'll be back in two years. And so I think you have to be very careful about those voices on the right who want to try and uh, use Christians to fight a political battle to try and restore a Christian culture. I think you have to accept we are moving into a pagan world and having accepted that, you then must build a biblical worldview. You must become convinced that Christianity is true. And so events like this are, are hopefully uh, a help to that. But then learn to think biblically, recognizing that your work colleagues, the people who sit beside you in lectures, people who sit beside you in the bus, are, have a completely different worldview from you. And so there's no point trying to uh, do your best to try and uh, you know, bolster some Christian culture. You, know, you have to accept uh, that the Bible's worldview is utterly different. So my final point on that is learn to stand courageously now while it's relatively easy uh, rather than, you know, just ducking down and, and waiting until it gets really bad. Thanks, Jim. And thank you for those questions. I appreciate there's quite a number we haven't got onto there, so apologies for that. But we'll be hanging around for a bit afterwards, so do feel free to come and, and talk to us about, uh, about these questions, and, and we'll, we'll do our best to to have, a, have an answer. But Jim, you're gonna just close our, our time uh, with, a, with a short epilogue. Just before I pray, I just yep. want to read a couple of verses. <laughs> Apologies that my voice gave out there um, for a few minutes. Um, so just before we sing our final hymn, uh, I wanna read just three verses from John chapter 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Some of you may have read the Russian novel, Dr. Zhivago. Uh, I tried to read it once, I got totally confused because every character had three different names. Uh, but at one point in the story, there's a conversation about Jesus and how different he was from the culture of Rome. And someone says, Rome was a flea market of borrowed gods and conquered peoples, a bargain basement on two floors, earth and heaven, a mass of convoluted filth, heavy wheels without spokes, eyes sunk in fat, sodomy, illiterate emperors, fish fed on the flesh of slaves, all crammed into the passages of the Colosseum and all wretched. And then into this tasteless heap of gold and marble, he came, emphatically human, deliberately provincial, Galilean. And at that moment, gods and nations ceased to be and man came into being, man the carpenter, man the plowman, man the shepherd with his flock of sheep at sunset, man who does not sound in the least proud, man thankfully celebrated in all the cradle songs of mothers the world over. And that contrast made me think of Christ before Pontius Pilate. On the great marble judgment seat sat the Roman, that cynical worldly man. Outside waited the loathsome religious hypocrites of the Sanhedrin. Like whitewashed tombs, their religious masks hid inner corruption and wickedness. And in contrast, standing in silent nobility, we see the blood-stained figure of Christ. He is the very source of all that is good and noble and pure and morally valuable in the world. And as the story unfolds, 
It seems that the powerful cynics and the vile hypocrites win in the end. Evil seems to triumph over good. No wonder Mary Magdalene wept as such bitter tears as she saw the corpse of the only good and decent man she had ever known being taken down from the cross. I just want to leave one simple thought with you before we pray. The resurrection proves that in the end, good will triumph over evil. Our culture is a flea market of borrowed gods, a tasteless heap of steel and glass. The cynical and the corrupt elite seem determined to drive the world back into the wickedness of paganism. It sometimes looks as if the good and the noble will be extinguished by that which is vile. I happen to live in a very beautiful part of the world, if somewhat remote, and every Sunday, Easter Sunday morning, I enact a little tradition. I get up just before dawn and stand on the step outside my kitchen door, and I watch the sun rise over the islands of Strangford Loch, and this morning was astonishingly beautiful. And in the quietness of that moment, I heard the calm, reassuring words of the risen Christ echo in my heart. Peace be with you. The source of all that is good did not linger in that cold tomb. He now lives in the power of an indestructible life. And one day he will lead us into a world, a world which is wholly good, wholly pure and innocent. So hear him speak now into your heart. Peace be with you. Christ will hold you fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold you fast. Raised with him to endless life, he will hold you fast. Till your faith is turned to sight when he comes at last. We're not in a unique situation today. The Christian church has been under attack since its earliest days. As I stood looking out at those islands of Strangford, I thought of that moment 1,500 years ago when St. Patrick landed his little craft on the shores I looked upon. We owe Patrick a great deal, not least because he has left us with perhaps the finest prayer in church history. And so before we sing our final hymn, we will use that prayer, the one known as St. Patrick's Breastplate, to bring our time to a close. Let us pray. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. I arise today through the strength of Christ's birth with his baptism, through the strength of his crucifixion with his burial, through the strength of his resurrection with his ascension, through the strength of his descent for the judgment of doom. I arise today in the hope of resurrection to meet with reward, in the prayers of patriarchs, in the predictions of prophets, in the preaching of apostles, in the faith of confessors, in the innocence of holy virgins, in the deeds of righteous men. I arise today through the strength of heaven, the light of the sun, the radiance of the moon, the splendor of fire, the speed of lightning, the swiftness of wind, the depth of the sea, the stability of the earth, the firmness of rock. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me from snares of devils, from temptations of vices, from everyone who shall wish me ill afar and near. I summon today all these powers between me and those evils against every cruel and merciless power that may oppose my body and soul, against incantations of false prophets, against black laws of pagandom, against false laws of heretics, against craft of idolatry, against spells of witches and smiths and wizards, against every knowledge that corrupts man's body and soul. Christ to shield me today against poison, against burning, against drowning, against wounding, so that there may come to me an abundance of reward. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. Amen.
the band want to come forward, we'll sing our final hymn.